What's going on, Packer fans? Welcome back into the Packer Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Thanks for joining me today. Please make sure to hit subscribe if you are not already subscribed. We'd greatly appreciate that. Happy Friday. Hope your weekend gets kicked off well. One piece of news to get into today before we get into our main topic, and that is Aubrey Pleasant as officially signed with the LA Rams as their new defensive backs coach slash passing game coordinator. He was an offensive consultant for the Packers last year. If you remember, he was the Lions defensive backs coach. He got fired mid-season. The Packers brought him in as an offensive consultant to kind of do uh, some scheme stuff, some game planning, and kind of see how other defensive you know coaches were sort of plotting against Green Bay. So kind of were able to throw some things off of him there. Uh, but he ends up taking the job with the Rams. Not super noteworthy. They do lose a consultant on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, But interestingly, I guess enough that the Rams thought enough of him to sign him as not only their DB coach, but as their passing game coordinator, the Packers had that position open. Jerry Gray left and they had that position open. They had somebody basically on staff in Aubrey Pleasant and they said, now nah, we're good. They go with Greg Williams and promote him to that same role. Uh, cornerbacks coach, I guess, cornerbacks coach instead of DB's coach is what it sounds like. Uh, but still with that passing game coordinator title as well. Just kind of interesting there that they brought somebody in from the outside rather than just going with Aubrey Pleasant. But long story short, Pleasant ends up with the Rams and the Packers still have Greg Williams on that side of the ball. And they technically, I guess, if they want, have an offensive consultant job open if they want to go in that direction. Who knows if they actually will or not. That was somebody that they just kind of picked up mid-season, probably to pick his brain a little bit. Probably wasn't any sort of major contract. But uh, anyway, long story short, again, Audrey Pleasant heads to the Rams and is no longer with the Packers. So that brings us to today's main topic. And today's topic is the Packers trade value ranking. So what I wanted to do here, if, if any of you follow the NBA at all, I think it's I think it's the ringer that does this. Is like right around the trade deadline, they'll list at like the top 100 players in the NBA and rank them in you know regard to who has the most trade value in the NBA from one to 100. And I think Giannis was one, Luka Doncic was two, and so on and so forth, right? So what I wanted to do today is put the Packers list together and basically go over who on this team has trade value and then rank it. I'm going from least trade value to most trade value is what I'm going to do today. Uh, But there were overall 23 players who ultimately had trade value, in my opinion, from high-end trade value to basically, you know, we'll give you a couple cookies and a bag of chips for this player. But there are 23 players that I thought had trade value. So a couple news, or not news, but a couple notes here first before we jump into it. A, I'm not advocating for any of these trades. B, some of them are like legitimately not possible because of the salary cap that Green Bay would have to take on if they made some of these trades. So this is not a, in you know, a, an exercise in like what could they do and how many draft picks could they get or anything like that. I'm not advocating for it. I'm not saying it's necessarily feasible or anything like that. I'm just specifically ranking these from who has trade value to who has the most trade value and so on and so forth. You'll kind of get the hang of it as we go along here, but that's what we're going to be doing today. So let's start off with the least trade value. And I have two players that I would say would be worthy of what I would kind of call change of scenery trades, meaning these are usually trades with players that maybe were high draft picks, didn't exactly work out in your system or on your team, and maybe you could trade them for a player that had the same situation on another team. Maybe uh, you know some player who was a second or third round pick who just didn't work out with their team. They'll you know you get that guy, they get your guy, and it's basically like a junk for junk trade, right? I'm not necessarily, again, advocating for either of these deals here. I'm not saying Green Bay should do these, but there's two players that come to mind as like a potential change of scenery trade. Maybe they could get a draft pick, like a a bust draft pick from another team in return. Both of them are third round picks, Sean Ryan and Josiah DeGuara. And a couple things here, and this is why it's worth noting that like, in order to make a trade, you have to have two parties that would want to make the deal, right? And I think Green Bay would not want to do a deal here in a change of scenery trade. But I also think you'd be hard pressed to find a team that's willing to give up legitimate draft capital for either Sean Ryan or Josiah DeGuara. Sean Ryan did not come into training camp in shape. He gets suspended through, you know, during his first season for performance enhancing drugs. And then he, you know, doesn't play all through the entirety of the season. 
it could not have been a worse season for Sean Ryan. So yes, he was a third round pick and I'm sure there's some inherent value there, but there's probably just more value to Green Bay than there is in any other teams. I'm sure there's some team that has a bust on their roster that would be like, yeah, we'll give you him and we'll try out Sean Ryan for size. But at this point, after a disastrous first season, to me, that would be more likely a, just a change of scenery trade. Maybe some team would give like a seventh round pick or something, but you're not getting much in exchange for Sean Ryan at this point. Josiah DeGuara, same thing. He is a H-back fullback that doesn't see a ton of the field. He's 26 years old, which is good. He's on a one-year, $1 million, $1.13 million deal, which is fine. But what team is going out of their way? Like what value is Josiah DeGuara bringing you, right? So once again, maybe there's some, you know, tight end that didn't work out for some other team that they're willing to say like, hey, we'll give you this tight end. You give us DeGuara and we'll kind of work things out and see if they just, you know, can be better with a change of scenery. I don't see any team that's like dying to give up any sort of legitimate draft capital for Josiah DeGuara at this point. So to me, two players who might have some slight value, but probably you're just getting something that is sort of junk in the other team's eyes in return. That would be, again, Sean Ryan and Josiah DeGuaro. All right, my next category is, hey, we'll throw a conditional draft pick at you. And here are, there, there are two different reasons here. The first one is Josh Myers. Now, Josh Myers, 25 years old, two years as a starter. He's on a two-year $2.59 million deal, right? I think that is a, a decent deal for a guy that started over the last two seasons, but he's been incredibly inconsistent and has not been what Green Bay expected him to be as a second round pick. That said, he was just a second round pick two years ago, and he has started in the year the, the league for two years. Some people, some team might look at him and say like, hey, I know he struggled at center, but maybe we can move him to guard and have him be better. This is why a conditional pick for, for Myers makes sense is because I could see, again, if Green Bay did want to go in this direction, which they wouldn't, but if they did want to go in this direction, they could say, all right, we're willing to trade Myers, but we want to get some condition on it where if he has a really good season or starts a certain amount of games for the other team, we get a better pick in exchange. Whereas the other team could say like, hey, we're willing to trade for him and give him a chance on our team. But if he doesn't end up playing much for us, we don't want to give something major in return. So that's where I could see a conditional pick being part of that conversation for Josh Myers. And then the other one in the we'll throw a conditional pick at you uh, category here is for a completely different reason, and that's David Bakhtiari. David Bakhtiari is 32 years old. He's got two years, $39 million remaining on his deal. And if he was traded, um, that would be if he was traded to the team. They would take on the two years, $39 million. He'll make more than that in Green Bay because of the signing bonuses and things like that. Technically, Green Bay already paid that. We don't need to get into all of that. But the team acquiring him would take on a two-year, $39 million non-guaranteed deal. I guarantee you that David Bakhtiari has some value, right? I think it's almost impossible for Green Bay and another team to really decide on what that value actually is because how do you value this? On the one hand, you have arguably a top three tackle in football. Trent Williams is one, and then David Bakhtiari starts getting in the conversation at minimum with anyone else. That's where he's at. So that has a ton, and I mean a ton of value. And you're more than willing to give 19.5 million a year for two years for that type of tackle, for that type of player. However, David Bakhtiari's had a very serious injury he is not, you know, he's basically missed a full year and then time into another year, has had to sit out some games, doesn't exactly know on any given game how his leg is going to respond to things. And that is going to be a very nerve wracking type of trade for the team that's acquiring him. Because not only are they taking on some salary cap in this situation, but they're giving up a, a draft pick too for a player who could get hurt in training camp and not even play for them because of some of the issues that he's already had with his knee. And that's why it's just so hard to come to a common ground of like, we think this player is worth this. That's why I think you get into the conditional pick conversation. It's not because some team isn't going to value him. I think they will, but I think Green Bay is going to want to say, hey, he's the best left tackle in football. If he plays X amount of games for you, like this could be worth like a second or third round pick. And the other team could say like, hey, if he only plays like three games, you know, four games or less, it's maybe only worth like a seventh round pick. And that's why I think there has to be a sliding scale there. So I think David Bakhtiari has value unquestionably, but because of the contract and because of the knee, it just makes it really hard to come to a consensus as to what that actual value would be. And that's why I think it's just that it would have to be some sort of, you know, conditional pick that would pay out based on how many games and how well, or potentially how well he played in 2023. So 
Uh, the we'll throw conditional pick at you deals are the Josh Myers and the David Bakhtiari deals. Next up is our late day three value. So I'm looking at sixth or seventh round picks in this year's draft if you were to trade one of these players. These are some big names on this list. So I'll explain my reasoning why. The other thing I'll mention here is whatever value you think a player has on your team, it's usually less, especially as players, you know, get older and have more snaps and wear and tear on their body. Like there just isn't usually a lot of value for those type of players unless they are elite, elite players. That's why you see Calais Campbell when he was traded, traded for like what, like a fifth round pick. And like every single off season, you'll see these veterans that you, they're big name veterans and they're, you know, making significant salary cap money and some team gets them for like a fifth round pick. And you're like, how does Calais Campbell go for a fifth round pick? Well, it's because they're older. They've had a lot of wear and tear in their body and because they have a large salary cap hit. So some of these guys, again, are going to sound like some big names, but you have to remember all that goes into it, age, wear and tear, performance last season, what you think you're going to still be able to get out of them, contract situation, etc. So late day three value, I have, I, I'm starting with Aaron Jones, 29-year-old running back on a two-year $28 million deal. That's a tough swallow for another team that would be acquiring him. Now, the good news is that two-year $28 million remaining for the team acquiring him would be completely non-guaranteed. So if after this year, you didn't get the ROI that you were expecting, you could potentially release him, but that's why it's a late day three pick, right? You're probably going to get one you know, good year of Aaron Jones, and then you're going to really wonder if next year's worth the contract at age 30 for a running back. The other thing is that as good as Aaron Jones is, teams are recognizing that it's not the best idea usually to pay high money for running backs. There's a lot of good running backs and this draft is chock full of incredibly talented running backs. So giving up any draft compensation for a guy even as talented as Aaron Jones is sometimes a really tough pill to swallow. Again, this is actually a compliment to Aaron Jones at this stage of his career with the contract that he has that I actually think he still has trade value at this point. But if it is, it's probably a late sixth, late seventh round pick, something that Again, if you're looking at it from Green Bay's point of view, isn't necessarily worth it unless you're going a full rebuild route, right? So uh, I do think also there could be a possibility that maybe you could get a little bit more for Aaron Jones uh, in, in draft compensation, but you'd have to restructure his contract first so that the acquiring team taking on Aaron Jones would pay him much less and Green Bay would take on that salary cap hit. Unfortunately, Green Bay's in no situation from a salary cap standpoint to actually be able to do that, which makes things that much more complicated. So I'm going late day three value for Aaron Jones. Next is TJ Slayton. This is another tough one. 26 years old, just kind of coming into his prime. He's two years, $2 million deal. I just think Green Bay is probably going to value him a bit more than other teams because he's actually played in their system. If you're another team looking to acquire Slayton, he hasn't exactly played a full season's worth of snaps at any given point. You've seen some flashes out of him, but you've also seen some inconsistencies. He was a fifth round pick. Now he's 26 and he's only got two years left on his deal. You're probably looking at uh, maybe a like for like, maybe you get like another fifth round pick in exchange for him, but probably more like a sixth round pick, in my opinion, for, for Slayton. And once again, if you're Green Bay, you, you don't really have much interest in doing that. But if you're another team that's looking to, to trade for play, you're probably just saying, you know, if I'm going to give up a third or fourth round pick for TJ Slayton, I'd rather just go out and get the best defensive lineman in the draft that's left in the third or fourth round at this point. So I do think Slayton has value, but it's probably late day three value. I think probably a sixth round pick, maybe a fifth a fifth round pick for, for Slayton in this situation. Next up is Devondre Campbell. Now this is an interesting one. Campbell is 30 years old. He technically has four years left on his deal, but when Green Bay trades him, they're going to take on all the, the signing bonus and things like that. So what the team acquiring him is basically, basically going to be getting is a one-year $5.25 million deal. If I'm another team, I'm probably will, and I'm like ready to compete for a Super Bowl or something like that, rather than battling teams out in free agency for some linebacker that is maybe mediocre at best, and it's not a great inside linebacker draft either, I'm not super opposed to trading a day three pick to the Packers for Devondre Campbell so that I get him on a one-year $5.25 million deal for this year and then can release him after if he doesn't pay off next year. Basically, I've got three years of team options if I'm the team trading for him after that. 
That doesn't sound so bad for a guy that was just a first team all pro uh, just two years ago. So if I'm if I'm a competing team, I don't hate you know giving out a late day three pick. That being said, he's 30. He wasn't as good a year ago. Definitely did not look like himself or like his all pro self from two years ago in the 2022 season. And he does still have a $5.25 million salary cap hit, which for an inside linebacker coming off a not great year, isn't necessarily uh, the, the best you know situation either. So I do think there is value there. Green Bay, once again, could probably get a little bit more for him if they took, if they ate a little bit more of his salary cap by moving it to signing bonus. But once again, they're not necessarily in the position to do that. But I do think Devondre Campbell has some late day three value. Next up is AJ Dillon, 25 years old, not a ton of wear and tear because he's basically been the number two back. I do think he probably has some late day three value. But again, this is a situation where it is a very strong running back class. And if you're acquiring AJ Dillon, he only has one year left on his contract. Now it's nice. It's a one year, $1.33 million deal, which is great. But now you go into next off season with you having to sign him to some sort of, you know, bigger contract, right? Again, with a loaded draft class, if I had the choice between AJ Dillon on a one year deal or like drafting the best available running back in the fourth or fifth round, I'm probably just taking the best available back in the fourth or fifth round. So that's why I think, yeah, some team is pro- would probably look at Dylan and say, yeah, we'll give you like a six round pick for him. And the, the team acquiring him is probably pretty happy with that deal. Green Bay is probably not, which is why, again, these deals are so hard to get done because so many times the team that has them on the roster already is just going to value them more than some team out there that hasn't had the experience with them and can just go and use the pick for a player at a similar position. But once again, I do think AJ Dillon has some day three value. And then last but not least is Samore Touré. Samore Touré is 25 years old, three years, $2.96 million deal. I do think this was a seventh round pick last year and he showed some flashes. If I'm a team, if I'm a GM of another team, if I get to the seventh round and I have my choice of random wide receivers in the draft, or I could ship a seventh round pick to Green Bay for Samore Toure, give me Samore Toure. I would much rather have that. I've seen more out of Samore Toure as a seventh round pick and like showing legitimate flashes than some random seventh round pick that I'm going to get probably from some small school that just showed up because he ran well in the combine or something, right? So I do think that he, and maybe it's a conditional seventh or something like that, but I mean, heck, Cole Van Landen went for like a sixth round pick, uh, I think just last year, right? So like sometimes you can find um, some of these, these, or maybe it was a seventh round pick, whatever. You get my point. Sometimes even though a guy was just a seventh round pick recently, you can still find a team that might be interested. I do think Samari Toure put enough on tape in preseason and regular season last year that he does have some late day three value as well. So Late day three values include Aaron Jones, TJ Slayton, Devondre Campbell, AJ Dillon, and Samore Touré. All right, that gets to my early day three values, which is like a fourth or fifth round value. That My first one here is John Runyon Jr. I do think he has like fourth to fifth round value. He's 26 years old, but he's on a one-year $2.74 million deal. Now that is a great deal for a starting guard. And teams would love to have a 26-year-old John Runyon Jr. on a one-year $2.74 million deal. The issue is you know that a contract is right around the corner. And while John Runyon is a you know really solid starter, it's not like he's been a Pro Bowl caliber starter or things like that. So he's definitely worth a early day three pick, in my opinion. And some team would be very smart to make that deal if they could get him at that value. But I just don't think he's more than that because you're going to have to pay him pretty significant, um, you know, a pretty significant contract probably just even next year as he's an unrestricted free agent. And if you don't sign him ahead of time, you could just lose him, right? So giving up a, a third round pick even for a John Runyon Jr. would be really, really steep. I think fourth to fifth makes a lot more sense there. Next up is Romeo Dobbs, 23 years old, three year, $2.96 million deal. At worst, right? You're getting probably a, you know, he was drafted in the fourth round. I mean, some team would be dumb not to give up a fourth round pick for Romeo Dobbs. You could argue here, like maybe even third round pick. I know, again, you're probably thinking like, Andy, like Romeo Dobbs is way better than that. And I think as a Packer fan and as a Packer GM, yeah, you would agree, right? But you go look at Romeo Dobbs, you know, sort of uh, like on the whole last year, we're, we were excited about him because we see the upside, right? But there's a lot of holes in his tape and in his game right now too. So while I think maybe a, a late, like, you know, maybe compensatory third round pick is within the realm of conversation for Romeo Dobbs, I think you're probably looking more towards early fourth round pick. And again, Green Bay wouldn't do that. They just hang on to him instead. But if, if for teams that would potentially be acquiring him, it's a really nice deal. Three years, he's still young. He showed some talent, but teams value top 100 picks 
just so much. Like they are not going to move off top 100 picks without getting a pretty significant player in return. Even a top fourth for Romeo Dobbs is actually, again, a pretty big compliment to a, a player who was just selected a year ago and um, actually appreciated in value over the last year, but probably not that much. And he's probably still late third, early fourth in this scenario. Same thing for JJ Kingsley and Igbari, right? 23 years old, three years, $1.97 million deal uh, remaining on, on that contract for the team that would be acquiring him. And you would love that deal for any team that's acquiring him. But once again, you're probably looking at a, a fourth round pick. I don't think he's worked his way up into that second or third round conversation. Maybe like Romeo Dobbs, you could get like a late third for him, but I think that's probably not the case. And even if you could, you're just keeping him anyway, right? So uh, the, again, that's why these deals are so incredib incredibly hard. But if I were valuing him throughout the league, I would say probably uh, an early fourth round pick, just like Romeo Dobbs. All right, that gets me into my day two value. So second or third round pick. And there's actually quite a few players. Just to recap, my day three values were John Running Jr., Romeo Dobbs, and Kingsley Nigbari. My day two values, starting with Jordan Love. 25 years old, one year, $3.9 million remaining on his contract. If you acquire him, he also has a fifth year option. He's so hard to judge, right? But in this league, you have value until you don't when you're picked that high, right? And we just, there, there's no reason to think that Jordan Love doesn't have value at this point because he's still a lottery ticket. Now, if he had gone out and just been a complete bust until this point, now you're talking like maybe you can get a seventh round pick for him or something, but he's showed progress. He, we, everyone knows he has talent and he hasn't busted yet. That's the one thing we know. So I do think at worst, you're looking at second or third round pick for Jordan Love. In, in all likelihood, Green Bay would like to get player compensation rather than draft pick compensation. Uh, but uh, I do think that he's probably in that day two value. Next is Zach Tom, 24 years old, three years, 2.96 million remaining on his deal for the team that would acquire him. He looked like a legitimate starter. To me, if I'm another team, I'm probably offering at least a third round pick for Zach Tom based on his performance a season ago, how young he is, how talented he is. There's no question to me he's worth at least a, a third round pick and probably worth uh, a top 100 pick for another team. So, you know, there's there's not value there for Green Bay. I think, again, you just hang on to him, but I do think he's probably in that day two conversation. Next is Quay Walker. 23 years old, three years, 5.89 million remaining. They would also have a fifth year option down the road on him as well. Uh, but I do think his value probably depreciated this last year. I think you're probably more likely to get a second or third round pick for Quay Walker after just selecting him in the first round a year ago. I do think he has a lot of upside. I do think he has a lot of talent, but I don't think he really showed like first round ability last year. That's not to say he's not going to be. It's not to say that he's not, that he can't be. But I think if you're looking at his body of work last year, I think like you're not getting a first round pick back for him. He was, you know, what, pick 22? I think you're probably more likely to get like an early day or early third round, maybe late second at best for Quay Walker at this point. Devontae Wyatt, same thing, right? He's now 25 years old. He's got three years, 5.62 million remaining on his deal. Would also have a fifth year option down the line, but just didn't play that much. He was a bottom round one guy last year, barely played, and that depreciates your value. So again, especially for an older rookie, right? I do think you can probably get a day two pick for him in return if you wanted to go in that direction. Um, again, Green Bay wouldn't, but I don't think you're, you're certainly not in the first round conversation for Devontae Wyatt. So probably day two at best. Same thing for Eric Stokes, right? Eric Stokes, phenomenal, not phenomenal, but really good in his first year, really bad in his second year. He's still only 24. He's a capable starting corner in this league. I don't know if I get to round three and I'm looking at the corners in, on my draft board and I'm not super enamored and I could get Eric Stokes for like a third round pick. I'd probably rather take the flyer on Eric Stokes in like the third round than I would on some random player in the draft. So I do th still think Eric Stokes has you know good value, but once again, not first round value for sure. He's coming off an injury as well, coming off a down 2022 season, doesn't really tackle, not super aggressive in the run game. And I think there's a, a little bit of a more limited upside than maybe Green Bay thought initially when they took him. So I do think he has day two value. Just don't think it's probably anything more than that. And then last but not least on my day two value, this is a really tough one. This is a really, really tough one to gauge. And that's Kenny Clark. He's now 20, he'll be 28 this year, 28 years old. He's had a lot of wear and tear and you have seen Kenny start wearing down at points throughout the season. He's played a lot of snaps throughout his career. So this isn't the same Kenny Clark that we saw a couple years ago. That said, he's still fantastic. He's still a really, really good football player. However, 
He's got two years, 33.25 million remaining for the team that would acquire him at 16.63 million a year. Giving up a day two pick for a for a defensive lineman, interior defensive lineman, that's not a top tier pass rusher, and you have to pay him 16.63 million per year, that's tough. Like I'm not sure. You you could be looking at more of a day three value, if I'm being honest. Like he's a real key for the Packers, and you certainly would never do that deal if you were Green Bay. But for a team that's acquiring him, man, that's a lot. That's a lot of draft compensation, like a day two pick plus 16.63 million for an interior defensive tackle who's going into his age 28 year, who's already played since he was age 20 in the NFL and has a lot of wear and tear on his body. If I'm a GM, I probably don't give up a second or third round pick for Kenny Clark as much. And I love Kenny Clark. I love, love, love Kenny Clark. But you're, this is a young man's game. And Kenny's, like I said, has a, a lot of snaps on his body. So maybe second third round pick, maybe you could get that in return, but there's a possibility that that could be more of a day three pick just because of his contract and his age and the amount of snaps that he's played. All right. So day two values, Jordan Love, Zach Tom, Quay Walker, Devontae Wyatt, Eric Stokes, and Kenny Clark, which leaves me with my top five. Coming in at number five, and this is probably early day two. I don't think probably day one for a couple of, or for at least this one maybe, but maybe it would at least be in the conversation. That's Elton Jenkins. He's number five on my list. 28 years old. He's got four years, 44.7 million remaining if the team would, if another team were to acquire him, but he would have no guarantees. And for the team acquiring him, even though he's 28 years old, if you were to acquire Elton Jenkins, the team that acquires him for the next two years gets him on a two year, $11.9 million deal. Like for Elton Jenkins, two years, 11.9 million because of how Green Bay structured that contract. And because Green Bay would be trading him, the the team acquiring him would have no guarantee to pay. So after that two years, 11.9 million, if Jenkins wasn't performing up to par once that contract goes up significantly, you can cut him with no no payments due. So it is an incredibly friendly contract for the next two years as he's playing in the prime of his career and is one of the best interior offensive linemen in football when he's playing well. So first round might be steep, but I think you could probably get at least an early second um, for, for his services. And I think, you know, a team acquiring him would get a really good player on a really good contract for the next two seasons. If I were a team that was looking to compete and needed some offensive line help, Cincinnati Bengals would be a great example. Heck, if I'm the Bengals, I would, I would consider a late first for Elton Jenkins. I really would, because he can play so many different positions. You get a super cheap deal uh, to help that team out and you get one of the top offensive linemen. Like that would probably be smart for, for the Bengals. So I think he has a, a lot of value um, because of how talented he is, because of his contract. He's still only 28. Uh, a lot of value there for Elton Jenkins. Number four is a little bit tough because of the injury. That's Rashawn Gary. One year, 10.9 million remaining on his deal. He's coming off a torn ACL. He's only 26 years old. He's an absolute stud, but you also know that you're going to have to pay him a massive deal coming up. That being said, I think some team would gladly give up at least a first round pick for the right to give Rashawn Gary that deal and have one of the best edge rushers in football, in my opinion. So I, he has at minimum first round pick value to me and maybe more than that, depending on what team would be acquiring him and how many teams could get involved in a bidding war there, but lots and lots of value for Rashawn Gary. Number three on my list is Christian Watson, 24 years old, and he's on a three-year, $4.6 million deal remaining. And you you have three years of super cheap control of a stud wide receiver who could be as good as any wide receiver in this league just based off of his raw talent and some of the explosiveness that we saw in his rookie year. He is a superstar waiting to happen if he can get if he can take that next step. There's no guarantee that he can, but the upside is massive. The floor we have now seen, the floor is extremely high and you are still going to get a really good player, even if he doesn't take a next step and you get him for three years, 4.6 million in the prime of 24, 25, 26 years old over the next three years. That is a beautiful, beautiful contract. And he would go for a pretty penny if Green Bay ever wanted to go in that direction, which obviously they would not. Number two on my list is Aaron Rodgers. And this one is so incredibly hard, right? And we might just find out exactly what he is worth, but is a four-time MVP at the most important position in sports who still plays at a high level. And if you open up the bidding for Aaron Rodgers, I still think some team might get super irrational and still be willing to give up multiple first round picks. I, I would be buyer beware because of the $60 million and because of the age and the decline we saw last year. 
like I said, I would be cautious if I were you as a Packer fan to think like, oh, they're going to get all this huge bounty of picks. I still think it might not be as much. And we're starting to see more reports that it might not be even a first round pick, but I still think it probably is. And I still think there's a lot of value there for Aaron Rodgers because there's not a lot of rational teams out there. And some teams probably going to be willing to give up a pretty penny to get his services, even if it's only for a year. And then last but not least, the highest value on the team, the player they could get the most for, long snapper Jack Coco. I'm just kidding. It's not Jack Coco. It is Jair Alexander. 26 years old, all pro corner, prime of his career, did have one injury a couple years ago, but has no lingering effects from it. He has a four-year $67.3 million contract, but that would be $16.8 million per year, which is completely, um, you're more than willing to pay that amount on a four-year deal for Jair Alexander as he would be ages 26, 27, 28, and 29 through that four-year contract. He's as good as it gets when it comes to a man cover corner. He's really good in zone. Yes, there's some times that tackling isn't his greatest forte, uh, but he is an intense individual. He is going to play the game the right way every single time he goes out there and plays, and he just has so much value. So you're going to see potentially a couple corners in this year's draft go in the top 10 of the draft. I know you have to pay some additional money, but man, the the ability to get Jair Alexander, uh, you, like I said, I think there is you know, potentially at least first round plus, right? And maybe even first and third, first and second, maybe even more than that. Like he would get a very pretty penny if you were to auction his services out to the rest of the teams in the NFL. And here's the thing, right? This is not an Aaron Rodgers situation where like maybe one or two teams are like interested in getting in that conversation. There's probably 31 other teams that would be interested in acquiring Jair Alexander. That's how good he is. And that's how, how hungry teams are for corners. So just to recap, my change of scenery guys, Sean Ryan, Josiah DeGuara, will throw a conditional pick at you, Josh Myers, David Bakhtiari. Day th- late day three value, Aaron Jones, TJ Slayton, Devondre Campbell, AJ Dillon, and Samore Toure. My early day three value, John Runyon, Romeo Dobbs, and Kingsley and Igbari. Day two value, Jordan Love, Zach Tom, Quay Walker, Devontae Wyatt, Eric Stokes, and Kenny Clark. Number five on my list overall, uh, and top tier value, I guess, is what I would say these are. Elton Jenkins, number four is Rashawn Gary, three Christian Watson, two Aaron Rodgers, and one is Jair Alexander, not Jack Coco. I am sure all of you agree with everything that I just said and have no disagreements with any of the 23 players on this list and where I place them. So uh, you can just like, and you don't even need to, you can comment how great I am and how perfectly I broke this down. Of course, if you disagree, I'm interested in your comments below. It's always tough, right? Trade value is insanely hard because value is in the eye of the beholder and every team and every individual and every GM and every fan has a completely different view of what value a player has. But I think if you were to look at it from an opposing GM side of things, I think today's list gives you an idea of what some of these players would be worth if you were to open them up. And that's why you don't see very many trades because as we went down this list today, were there any of them that you were actually like, hey, if I were GM of the Packers, like if I could get X, you know, that that fifth round pick for that player, would you actually do it? There wasn't many. I think if you're looking at this from a Packers GM that you would be like, yeah, I'm super excited and I would love to do that deal. And that's why when you're selling, you, a lot of times you get less than what you think you should. And that's why a lot of these deals don't actually end up happening. That does it for me. Thank you so much for joining me. We'll be right back here tomorrow with an all new topic, an all new episode. Don't miss it. But until next time, and as always, Go Pack Go.